A very warm hello and welcome to this webinar on a practical guideline to avoid microplastic from artificial turf in football and to provide recommendations for turf pitch setup and maintenance within the SDG Striker project. SDG Striker aims to increase organizational capacity for good governance in grassroots sports organizations by supporting the implementation and communication of the Sustainable Development Goals. Relevant research findings of sustainability aspects have been compiled on three focal areas, energy poverty, energy efficiency, photovoltaics, and green turf pitches and fillers. The funding of the project by the European Commission under the Erasmus Plus program is gratefully acknowledged. The 17 SDGs are shown in this figure. It is a shared concept for peace and prosperity for people and the planet. In total, they include 169 targets that are assigned to the different goals. According to the United Nations Sports in general is an important enabler for sustainable development. In order to fulfill the SDGs, it is essential to have a healthy society and physical activity and sports are helpful to achieve these goals. Physical activity is essential for improving health and contributes to both the prevention and treatment of disease. People who are physically active and participate in sports benefit on a social, physical and mental level. Sport does not only benefit the physical fitness, but it can also communicate a healthy lifestyle to children. Moreover, physical exercises also have a positive effect on mental health, self-esteem and self-confidence. Sport also promotes tolerance and respect and it contributes to the empowerment of women and young people, individuals and communities. So why can football accelerate SDG spread? All over the world millions of adults and their families visit sports stadiums each year and sport facilities serve as an emotionally captivating scape, inspiring lifelong memories. Consequently this is the ideal possibility for the fans to become aware of on-site solar power generation, energy and water-efficient building design, zero-waste practices, recycling and composting programs, etc. Related to that are minimized environmental impacts, financial benefits as well as brand benefits, etc. One pilot of the SDG project is related to the microplastic concern of artificial turf and turf filler that are used for the football pitches. Therefore, the pilot located in Norway deals with this issue and aims at finding greener alternatives to microplastic in the context of turf filler materials. With this pilot four SDGs are addressed, including Goal 9, Industry, Innovation and Infrastructure, Goal 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities, Goal 12, Responsible Consumption and Production, Goal 13, Climate Action. In Norway football is the most popular sport and therefore also provides a great benefit for the health not only for children, but also for adults. Hence, the use of artificial turf pitches is required to meet the large demand. But not only in Norway, but in general artificial sport pitches all over Europe play a very relevant role. The European Chemicals Agency states that every day, sports pitches with infill material out of plastic or rubber granules are used by millions of Europeans. These infill materials are used very often as they provide several advantages. With such filler material, the pitches are more durable and weatherproof and in addition it brings more shock absorption and traction. However, with artificial turf pitches which use plastic and rubber material as infill the problem of microplastic and the related environmental impacts and the potential human health risks need to be considered. As seen in this figure an artificial turf system is built up in layers that interact in a complex manner. Brushing, stripping, cleaning and watering is usually done by volunteers or full-time employees. In addition, the refilling of infill is also part of the maintenance. The lifetime of an artificial turf pitch depends on the artificial turf carpet and is generally around 12 to 15 years. What are the mechanisms behind infill loss and potential microplastic release? Generally, the release of microplastic in the environment takes place through wear and tear of the artificial grass fibers and spreading the infill material. We can consider different release pathways, e.g. the release to surrounding soil area, paved areas around the fields and subsequently released to sewerage systems via grates, for example via releases from shoes and clothes of the players. Indoor environment through particles in sports bags, shoes and clothes which are removed by vacuum cleaning or released to sewerage systems via washing machines. Drainage via drainage water and released to sewerage system or released to nearby streams due to rainfalls. There is not one definition of microplastic, 
but according to the European Chemicals Agency when speaking of microplastic small, usually microscopic and solid particles made of a synthetic polymer are meant. Microplastic particles can lead to challenges due to several reasons. Concerning the size, typically, the microplastic particles are microscopic and can therefore be easily ingested and then transmitted up the food chain. Resistance to environmental biodegradation Due to its high resistance to environmental degradation after their release the microplastic particles are in the environment for a very long time. Degradation into continuously smaller particles Via fragmentation the particles are degrading in the environment in particles that are getting smaller and smaller. Impossible to be moved from the environment. Once the microplastic particles have been released to the environment it is not possible to remove them again. Microplastic continuously pollutes the ecosystem and have been found in freshwater, marine as well as terrestrial ecosystems. This arise concerns not only for the environment, but also regarding human health. After having analyzed different hazardous substances and components in microplastics and microplastics itself, the European Chemicals Agency proposed a restriction of a full ban of intentionally added microplastics, such as in artificial pitches. Subsequently, the Committee for Socioeconomic Analysis and Committee for Risk Assessment agreed to the proposal in December 2020. However, the Committee for Socioeconomic Analysis did not fully endorse the notion to include the filling materials in artificial turf pitches, as they reckoned it was a policy decision if emission reduction or microplastics are the main area of interest. According to information on the website of the European Chemicals Agency a discussion with member states and a decision are expected still for 2022. As the concern about microplastic becomes more and more relevant, it definitely makes sense to think about alternative infill materials to the rubber turf filler. However, as already mentioned before, all the currently available alternatives provide its own advantages and disadvantages. Therefore, before an alternative infill material is implemented, several points should be considered. The economic dimension. What is the price of the material? Is it economically feasible? A technical dimension concerning the quality and durability of the alternative material, how often does it need be replaced or refilled? The environmental dimension, what could be possible environmental impacts of the turf filler? What are the environmental consequences when the infill material ends up in the environment? What are the potential environmental impacts over the whole product life cycle? And last but not least, also very important is the social dimension concerning health and safety for the players and related acceptance. Moreover, the following table summarizes noticeable differences between the two options of natural grass versus artificial turf. For natural grass pitches significant amounts of irrigation are needed for growth and if not managed carefully, there is the risk of nutrient-slash-chemical leaching from pesticides and fertilizers into waterways. On the other hand for artificial turf no irrigation for growth needed, but there is the possibility of leaching of heavy metals and other residues form plastics or rubber infill depending on the used materials. Natural grass helps to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through photosynthesis and stores it as organic carbon in soil. This makes it an important carbon sink. For artificial turf carbon emissions occur during the processing, production, transportation, installation, maintenance and disposal phase. The material impacts over the whole life cycle increase the carbon footprint. Grass is a natural product grown from seed. Water and chemical inputs, fertilizer and pesticides, are required for growth and quality. For artificial turf petrochemical product where mostly virgin materials are used. Some of the materials can be made from recycled material, e.g. rubber granules infill and shock pad. There is no definitive end of life of natural grass, but it can be replaced to improve the current surface. Normally, no disposal is required. In contrast artificial turf usually ends up in incineration of landfill where it takes a long time to decompose. Therefore, the disposal costs are rather high. Natural grass provides natural heat dissipation. Heat is absorbed by the grass and it cools the surrounding environment. Artificial turf usually provides a heat reflection so the material absorbs and radiates heat and therefore heats the surrounding environment. This can be uncomfortable and unsafe in hot weather conditions. The color of the artificial turf may influence the level of reflection. Regardless of the pros and cons there is a strong need for artificial turf pitches. 
Hard courts are no longer considered up to date by clubs and players and have therefore been converted into natural or artificial turf pitches for some time. Artificial turf surfaces enable a year round sporting activity offer for team sports, especially in highly dense cities as well as regions with high land prices. Consequently, the following part of this webinar provides some recommendations specifically addressing the various stakeholders affected. In addition to the benefits of artificial turf pitches, operators and users must also be made aware of their responsibility for the ecological and social effects that go hand in hand with them. Sealed areas and urban areas are suitable for conversion to artificial turf pitches. The realization on such areas should be preferred in order to meet the demand. Another recommendation is to evaluate the local demand in detail and also consider the potential shift to new trend sports. What about the player's opinion? Artificial turf plays a central role in many people's lives and allows sports to be played outdoors all year round. Rubber granules are still the preferred infill type, but users definitely see cork and unfilled pitches as an alternative. In general, the majority of respondents expect artificial turf pitches to become more environmentally friendly. For a lot of people, especially young ones, football and consequently also football pitches are a very important aspect of their lives. For this reason, and because the players would like to see more environmentally friendly fields, this offers a good opportunity for modern participation processes at the municipal level. Consequently, the interest in sports can serve as a way to test participatory democracy and the assumption of social responsibility for ecological solutions and to establish them as a municipal practice. There are a large numbers of options and different suppliers of artificial turf pitches. Therefore, preliminary planning and decision-making should be largely independent of the manufacturer. The manufacturer should be able to provide information on maintenance effort and costs, including infill refilling. It is important to demand guarantees far above the legal warranty for the durability and service life of granulates and artificial turf carpet, as the pitches are subject to considerable weathering. It should be examined whether there is sufficient demand to achieve a high intensity of use well above that of natural turf. How are artificial turf pitches structurally integrated? The selection of the location, the surroundings, and the layout of the artificial turf pitch depend on local conditions, legal regulations, and the preferences of the operator. An artificial turf is permeable to water and drains precipitation water. A distinction is made between infiltration, vertical drainage, collection and drainage, horizontal drainage, and supporting drainage. Most of the water seeps away on or next to the artificial turf field. The rest is collected and discharged. When selecting a site, local water management and ecological conditions, including extreme weather events and flooding, should be considered. In order to avoid infill loss due to heavy rain events, it is important to create generous infiltration areas in surrounding area. If rainwater is or can be discharged into the storm sewer or directly into the receiving water, the installation of filter elements to retain infill is recommended. In the case of combined sewers, retentions options would need to be considered. Where are artificial turf pitches located? Based on a study relying on Germany and Switzerland, the location of artificial turf pitches varies very much. Within a radius of 1 km, there may be over 50,000 people living or almost none. Artificial turf pitches should be fully documented in an official database according to location, surroundings, and construction method. In addition, also the population density, as well as environmental and nature protection aspects in a defined radius should be included. Additionally, artificial turf pitches should be implemented in dense, urban areas, but not in water protection or flood areas. Any subsidies should be based on actual demand and should not be granted for construction in natural areas that need protection. What about the economic dimension of artificial turf pitches? There are very large cost differences, as different turf systems require different infrastructure and maintenance approaches. Annual cost consideration level out many differences between natural and artificial turf pitches. Regarding hours of use, there are clear cost advantages for artificial turf pitches. If this would also be the case when more and more environmental regulations become relevant, is still uncertain. The economic feasibility of artificial turf should be based on a detailed survey of demand in hours of use per year. This should be determined over a longer period of time before the decision to build is made. It is also important to consider external costs due to expected environmental damage. 
In the economic analysis it is necessary to also take into account the costs for cleanups, structural measures such as barriers, walls, additional efforts in wastewater treatment to reduce emissions, as well as the end-of-life phase like recycling, thermal recover, etc. Furthermore, also costs for potential future requirements in this context need to be included in the analysis. How much infill is on the pitches and what does it perform? A few results on the change in particle size distribution over time suggest that the performance of the infill is pulverized over time it becomes more brittle. Partly the infill is distributed very unevenly on the pitches. This effect increases with the age of the pitches. The central recommendations here are that innovation efforts for infill-free artificial turf systems and alternative infill materials should be encouraged. The systems should be tested in demonstration projects. When developing new infills, the technical performance and the risk of injury to players regarding the different systems should be kept in mind. There is a dissent in scientific publications regarding the thesis that infill accumulates over a wide area on the pitches as a result of compaction. Therefore, it should be verified experimentally and in practice in the case of further use of performance infill in future artificial turf systems. How much infill is lost? The infill losses vary considerably. In a study in Germany and Switzerland, the average performance infill loss is 2.98 T per year with 2.68 T per year need to be refilled. There is not found a correlation with the age of the pitches, but a low density of infill seems to favor discharge. As refilling and loss rates do not correlate and the experimentally determined loss rates are significantly higher than many recently published values, experimental evidence on loss rates depending on design, care and maintenance as well as type and intensity of use should be carried out and made transparent. The specifications for the loss rates should be laid down in the corresponding calls for proposals and the relevant regional standards. Depending on how demanding these loss rates are defined, this also favors unfilled or purely sand-filled sites. What is known about fiber loss? From an environmental perspective it is not only necessary to look at performance infill, but also at fiber losses. The few available experimental studies suggest high losses of artificial turf fibers. Discharge may vary depending on fiber input weight and infill type. At the same time, it probably increases with the age of the pitch. Current estimates range from about 50 kilograms to over 1 ton per year. The extent to which these losses are discharged, captured as waste during maintenance work or remain in the artificial turf has not been investigated. However, it is obvious that the dispersion via players plays a particularly large role. One recommendation to the manufacturers is that information on the durability of the artificial turf should be provided in the form of quantitative fiber losses over the lifetime and per year in product data sheets. At the same time, these requirements should be included in specifications and corresponding guarantees agreed. The European Chemicals Agency or national environmental authorities should consider whether abrasion of plastics in applications, as represented by fiber loss in artificial turf fields, can also be taken into account in future restriction procedures. What are the release pathways of the infill material and where does it stay? Rubber granules are discharged from artificial turf fields and are found almost everywhere in the environment of the pitch. Strong winds and heavy rains cause the emission to spread beyond the area surrounding the pitch, as those rubber granulates are found at inaccessible points sometimes very far from the pitches. Infill material often ends up on natural or artificial barriers, example green areas or structures, which prevent further mobility of the infill. Large amounts of granules can accumulate in the surrounding area without being visually apparent. The place where the infill ends up depends on the layout of the pitch, the surrounding environment and the geographical conditions. In order to limit these release pathways the pitch environment needs to be designed by means of barriers in such a way that the spread of infill is prevented and unavoidable losses are returned to the pitch or disposed. The corresponding specifications should be included in norms, standards and quality labels, whereby it should not be related to the design, but the performance in order to give manufacturers the freedom to develop innovative and effective solutions. In order to prevent the dispersal of granules and fibers by players, appropriate technical and organizational measures need to be considered and the player's awareness and responsibilities in that sense needs to be addressed. What about other environmental effects of artificial turf? Artificial turf pitches largely comply with the limit values for various pollutants. 
a few studies show limit values exceeded for individual heavy metals. Nevertheless, there are differences between different material options and discussions and studies on pollutants continue. In addition to the performance infills, the critical consideration should also concern the elastic layers and the artificial turf fibers. Additionally, the potential overheating of artificial turf fields and their relevance to the urban microclimate, as well as the water requirements to counteract these effects, should be considered as part of the advanced planning process. The recommendations here are that since artificial turf pitches have a long lifetime and are ideally recycled at the end of their life, high standards should be set for the materials to be free of pollutants, which go beyond current legal requirements. This requires corresponding specifications in the calls for proposals. These should not only apply to infills, but also to the fibers and the damping system. It should be checked whether sufficient quantities of water are available for cooling the pitches in summer. This should be included in the ecological and economic assessment. What is the standard regarding recycling? The artificial turf industry is striving for the fullest possible mechanical recycling of the artificial turf and also of the elastic base layer. A closed-loop approach for the entire artificial turf or even individual components with the exception of infill sand is not yet apparent. Mechanical recycling will result in higher end-of-life costs and recycling of ELT granules form artificial turf fields could compete with direct recycling of scrap tire granules. The central recommendations on this aspect are to include sufficient provisions for the restoration, recycling or disposal of the artificial turf at end-of-life. The recycling rate and recyclability of all components should be part of product description and specifications. A framework is needed to favor the best recycling routes for ELT granules, both ecologically and environmentally. Depending on the type of artificial turf, the carbon footprint varies between 9.4 to 29.5 kg CO2 EQ per hour played on a 7,500 square meters field. It strongly depends on the chosen infill. As a biogenic material, cork has a lower CO2 footprint compared to fossil-based filling materials. The greenhouse gas emissions associated with disposal are especially relevant for infill types such as SBR, EPDM, or TPE. High-quality recycling of components and longer lifetime of filling material and the damping system can significantly reduce the carbon footprint. Here we recommend that permissible carbon footprints over the life cycle or at least the manufacturing phase should be specified in calls for proposals and specifications. Their calculation should be carried out as part of environmental declarations for artificial turf systems. The permissible values should be reduced to below 10 kg of CO2 EQ M2. The norms, standards and quality labels hardly go beyond the legal minimum requirements in their environmental requirements. Microplastic emissions in the form of fibers and granules are addressed only marginally and without targets. As environmental regulations often become more stringent over time and as more knowledge is gained, the standards relevant to artificial turf pitches have not yet created sufficient planning certainty for either manufacturers or operators. Consequently the clear recommendation are quality marks for artificial turf pitches must contain demanding environmental targets that go beyond the legal regulations. This is the only way for manufacturers and operators who rely on these quality marks to ensure that artificial turf pitches meet expectations in terms of environmental compatibility in the long term. In order to avoid lock-ins and not to endanger competition between companies, it must be ensured that norms, standards and quality marks do not define forms of construction, but rather demanding and measurable environmental objectives. With this information we are at the end of our webinar. We hope the information will help you and wish you best of luck and good success in installing and maintaining your perfect pitch. Please also consider the two other webinars from the SDG Striker Project and follow us on social media. The financial assistance provided by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union is gratefully acknowledged. This material is based upon the referenced work and the author make no warranty or assumes any liability or responsibility of any information regarding privately owned rights.